good morning everyone then peters institute of pharmaceutical sciences feels delighted to welcome you all today for this webinar on emerging infectious diseases management pharmacists perspective this webinar is organized in association with ipa anamkonda local branch and is for india telangana chapter and along with our proud alumni today's theme is the most crucial healthcare phenomenon especially over the events of the past two years we are sure our event today will be enlightening to all our delegates and with this i will like to request our principal dr p rajshekar to deliver the welcome good morning everyone i am uh, dr rajshekar uh, representing st peter's institute of uh, pharmaceutical sciences uh, so uh, this is one more uh, wonderful session that i am going to be like so uh, uh, happy to hear about because uh, they are three students of mine and i am proud to say that they belong to st peter's and all the three have uh, done very wonderfully well when they were in uh, academic uh, in our college and also today's session is on uh, emerging infectious uh, disease management uh, in a pharmacy perspective so i welcome all the delegates on behalf of st peter's institute of pharmaceutical sciences and i welcome uh, all the three speakers for today and uh, the three sessions will be like a, a wonderful uh, package of knowledge that is like uh, uh, required for this particular uh, hour where you are talking about all that uh, disease that are spreading and all the pandemic what is now going on so this is a right uh, kind of uh, webinar that will be suiting to the particular situation so once again i welcome all the three speakers on behalf of st peter's and uh, i wish all the organizers will make sure that the things are happening smooth thank you everyone thank you for your kind words sir now i would like to request our visionary uh, the chairman of st peter's institute of pharmaceutical sciences uh, ct jaypal reddy sir to deliver the presidential address so uh very good morning you all uh, i'm so delighted to see all our alumni today taking up uh, this particular webinar on the the latest uh, uh concepts where a pharmacist can really intervene in the emerging diseases so i think uh, the perspective of a pharmacist in this present scenario is with a bigger role uh you might have known when this covid has come this new emerging uh, uh, kind of disease which has come uh, for the last uh, we are facing for the last approximately two years i think there is a uh, unprecedented uh, kind of drugs given to the patients without looking into other perspectives i think we know after side effects when they have taken this medication i think uh, more than 70% have suffered a long illness after effects of this particular covid the right kind of dose was not given they have bulldozed heavy dosage on the uh, every covid patient or predictive covid patients even many of the people across the globe they have taken this medication might be steroids might be antibiotics might be any kind of doses which are not required to that particular situation i think but when it has passed through a right pharmacist when a i think a genuine pharmacist sitting there they never allowed unnecessary medication to the patient even i have uh, because in the market in the what to call in the uh, whatsapp messages or you name it everyone was giving their own perspective but i've come across a particular uh, perspectives of a pharmacist where they were denying 100% that this particular dosage is not required at all the kind of medication some people are buying with 1 lakh 2 lakh uh, medications they are under impression that this particular dose is going to really help the patients but generally every pharmacist they told sir that medication is not required so i think uh, uh definitely i feel there's a bigger biggest and more responsible roles for every pharmacist i think you are the need of the hour i think uh, even uh, recently when i was talking to every covid hit patient they were telling this particular covid we are came we came out of this particular uh, trauma but still after three months still we are facing side effects of that particular medication just i think every 70 to 
percent of patients will tell the same story. I think uh, we have to come and we have to open up. We have to tell this world. There's a pharmacist who is the right person who can tell his perspective on what kind of medication and whether this medica medication is going to really what you call uh, give the benefit or what kind of side effects, what is the precautionary they have to take it. So everything, I think you are the people where you have to intervene in the total health care system. So I'm so happy to see Mriganka, Paul, uh, Sabina and uh, Hema coming today's webinar and uh, every person has got their own distinctions in their life and uh, you have really achieved your own milestones and i'm so delighted uh, being the st peter's alumni you're coming back uh, as an alumni team and uh, giving and uh, sharing your experiences uh, on st peter's alumnus uh, portal today and this particular webinar will be really benefiting all your juniors and uh, I wish uh, this particular program is going to take to the next level. And uh, uh, the world is full of opportunities and you are the right people to tell them. Subject to condition, every student should equip with a lot of knowledge, information and the kind of confidence and the right kind of attitude. Because until you display your knowledge, I think no one is going to really welcome us. All these webinars should enlighten us Every speaker is going to give, share their experiences. And uh, this is the right opportunity to learn as much as you can. The more you listen, the more you learn. And the kind of information that you are going to build in yourself, I think that's the way you are going to demonstrate yourself. And the world is going to listen to you. So I wish you all the best for this particular webinar. And uh, I really thank all the organizers. Uh, Dr. Praveen Randir and the principal uh, Raj Seker and uh, the entire team of St. Peter's. So I wish you all the best for this particular program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. Now I'd like to request uh, Dr. Randir Chaudhary, Assistant Professor St. Peter's Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, to speak about the webinar. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we feel delighted to meet you all once again in this occasion. Our today's theme is management of emerging infectious diseases. In this present day, world infectious diseases have threatened the very basic of humankind. Furthermore, with the advent of emerging drug resistance, it becomes a crucial role to support the healthcare community in tackling this issue. We are encouraged further by the wonderful response from our delegates with more than 60 pharmacy institutions across the country and the clinical pharmacists have registered for the webinar. We sincerely hope we will cater to your needs in this aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranadir. I will now rec uh, request uh, Dr. Dharani, Assistant Professor, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sabina Hussain Sayed. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sabina Hussain, Assistant Professor and Head of the Department, Genba Sopendra of Mozi College of Pharmacy, Pune, Maharashtra. She has completed her PhD in Pharmacognosy from Pune College of Pharmacy, Bharati Vidyapit, deemed University, Pune. Dr. Sabina Hussain has 11 years of teaching experience and done several research projects. She has published around 10 papers in reputed journals with good impact factor. She received Best Poster Award at Indian Association of College of Pharmacy, Second Pharmaceutical Sciences Congress, and also at 20th annual national convention of association of pharmaceutical teachers of india i'm happy to introduce you ma'am please start the session thank you dr dharni for the brief introduction uh, first i want to thank you thank jaypal reddy sir raj shaker sir and the, all the praveen sir and all the faculty of the st peters for giving me this opportunity uh, now i just want to share my ppt and let's start with the first talk Let's let me share my screen. Is it been coming up, sir? Yes, ma'am. Please start with your PPT. Okay. Is it visible, sir? 
yes ma'am sorry sir okay thank yes. you so as we going with the theme of the webinar i want to uh, give a talk on natural products in the management of emerging infectious disease so before going to the uh, talk as it is a privilege to me to introduce to the my college that is i am working now it's the genba sopan rao mose college of pharmacy it's been established in 2008 and the courses that are being offered are bachelor in pharmacy b pharmacy and d pharmacy so next uh, i want to let you know what are the contents that are going to be you are seeing up in this webinar are that uh, i am going to introduce about the sources of natural drugs where are where they are been coming up from next the advantages of those natural drugs and what are the different types of communicable communicable diseases that are being now present in this world and how the world is suffering from those diseases and next coming to the pathophysiology of the covid 19 and what are the role of those natural drug in the management of this covid 19 next in the last i will share the uh, my talk on also the vaccines so coming to the natural sources of the drugs there are uh, five different natural sources that are being uh, present uh, those are from the plants animals microbes my marine sources and minerals these are the five natural sources where the drugs are going to be coming up from so i have taken some example over here papaver somniferum this is a plant drug from which we have isolated from which the from the, this plant this morphine is been isolated all of us know that this is going to be acting as an analgesic drug so other is been this pyrotus ostreatus this is a mushroom so from that mushroom this lower starting is being isolated which is an hypolipidemic drug so microorganisms as we well known with the penicillin that's an antibiotic okay that is also been isolated from the natural sources so minerals marine sources so all of these have been isolated from the natural sources so what is the importance of this natural sources means they are going to be acting as a lead molecules okay as we can see if you take this morphine drug okay when you see this morphine drug the structure has been modified and the new drug is been introduced that is naturally derived molecule that is codeine which is a potent anti tussif agent so this natural sources of drugs they do not only uh, produce the uh, different uh, drugs but also they are being used as a substrate for the synthesis of lead molecules which are having a high potent activity now i want to also tell you about this cetiranthus roseus vinca vinca rosea so in this from this vinca rosea we have uh, this vinca rosea vincristin and vinblastin has been isolated which is also a potent anti cancer agent so this these are the different sources from which the drugs are being isolated and they have been used for the treatment of different diseases so as you if you see this diagram you will get to know that what is the importance of this natural sources in the approved drugs so if you see here these are the natural this green color is the natural drug that is having the 67.4 percentage of the natural drug that are being approved in the from the year from the year 1981 to 2014 so here these are the natural botanicals it is nothing but these are also the drugs which are having a mixture of plant drugs these are the mixture of plant drugs now if you see this nd that is nothing but natural derivatives okay natural derivatives are like uh, as i have mentioned the example of morphine to codeine so that natural derivatives see the percentage of the sharing uh, the percentage shared drugs and also the vaccines if you see the vaccines these are also the natural products okay uh, as these vaccines are biological preparation biological bio that is nothing but a uh, from the living organism so these also comes under the uh, natural drugs next coming to the uh, b b part of the drug that is nothing but back, biological macromolecules what is this biological macro molecules means these are the large organic molecules that are nothing but carbohydrate proteins uh, amino acid all this so if you see, uh, see this diagram the half more uh, half of the uh, portion is being shared by the natural drugs in the uh, in the evaluation of new drugs in the production of new drugs half of the diagram is being shown as a, a drugs obtained from the natural sources now if you see the synthetic pure synthetic drug only that is the 61.4% uh, 
so this is the importance of the natural drugs in approving new drugs and approving new drugs some are the how what whatever the conventional medicines which you are being using now that are being obtained from the natural drug they are been modified they are been derived and they are being used for different diseases okay so this is the importance of the natural uh, drugs now if i want to say the advantage of this natural drugs in the treatment of diseases or in the drug discovery process there is a big advantage of this natural drugs see in any conventional uh, approach like uh, in the production of conventional medicine like uh, any synthetic medicines what they are going to do is they are going to first identify the lead molecule okay first they are identifying the lead molecule then they will perform this in vitro studies then in vivo studies after that if it is been successful they perform it in the clinical trials okay they will go for the clinical trials for uh, ensuring the safety after that clinical trials are being successful then only it is approved for the clinical use okay from approved for the clinical use so from this a uh, conventional approach you can see that lead molecules are identified then they are being uh, verified then they are being used in the market but if you are taking as a natural drug what we will do is we will approach the reverse pharmacology okay we will approach the reverse pharmacology what is the reverse pharmacology means in the traditional medicines in the natural medicines we are going to take the medical medicinal plants or natural products that are being used traditionally since ages since ages uh, they are been used for example if you take this uh, um, most commonly haldi that is nothing but turmeric the turmeric is been used as an antiseptic and it is been well mentioned in the literature that it is going to be used as an anti tussive anti Uh, even if you have a cough cold what you will do you will just take this uh, turmeric powder uh, you will just dissolve it in the milk and you will uh, drink it so that it is fine it is going to be fine so that here in this reverse pharmacology the use of the drug is been well mentioned in the scriptures okay the the use of the medicines are been well mentioned in the scriptures in all the traditional practice like charaka samhita shushtaka samhita so from that well known drugs we are taking those plants then we are performing the clinical studies okay we are performing the clinical studies then after it is being successful then it is being released into the market so that is the reverse pharmacology that is going to be ha having a great advantage in production of new drugs because in the conventional method if you see in a uh, like uh, for a, after post marketing surveillance like a drug will take around 10 to 15 year to come up into the market and also one the, in the money wise time wise the most of the energy is being utilized in the money wise most of them are being taken like uh, 1 billion dollar being in, in utilized in production of the new drugs conventional drugs whereas here as it is been a traditional approach and in the reverse pharmacological approach what that is been well mentioned we are this we are uh, clinically verifying it so the time it is time saving from 5 to 16 years the new drug is going to be uh, released into the market and also it cost it is going to have the less cost so everyone will talk about the advantages of the natural medicine it is the no side effects and the easily available yeah those are the factors that are going to be there definitely but the most important factor is advantage is it is that the reverse pharmacology and that is being used in the that is going to have a great impact in the drug discovery process as it will lessen the uh, like uh, less in the time and also it will invest less amount of the money so we can save time and energy so that's the most important advantage of this natural drugs now another advantage i want to tell you i have um, mostly i have placed as a figures so that everyone all the pharmacy students undergraduate students can easily understand now i have taken here the curcumin nothing but curcumin is a isolated compound from the turmeric Okay, that curcuminoids is the isolated compound from the term uh, from the haldi. That is nothing but turmeric. Now, if you I, that isolated curcuminoids, if you see the health benefits of the curcuminoids, now it is going to be used in the arthritis. Okay, analgesic. It is going to have an analgesic uh, effect in the arthritis. 
so that uh, uh, that that is one of the use and it is also used as antidepressive antimicrobial antiinflammatory anti antioxidant activity these are the five benefits there are lot of other benefits the most important benefits are with the health benefits are these five now if you see in the conventional medicines if any uh, rheumatoid arthritis patient if you go and uh, meet a uh, doctor what they are going to give you is ibuprofen or acetaminophen they are going they are analgesic in nature but ibuprofen is non selective cox inhibitor so it is also going to inhibit the cox 1 enzyme so once it is inhibiting the cox enzyme that will decrease the production of prostaglandin that will line the gastrointestinal tract so what happens is it will damage the gastrointestinal tract and it will uh, cause ulcer ibuprofen so whatever the so whenever you see when a doctor is prescribing any narcide he will give you an anti ulcer drugs okay because anti acid drugs because it is the side side effects of this ibuprofen is it causes ulcers so if you come up to this natural drug that is curcumin what is happening is it is having the analgesic action and apart from the and also one more thing i want to mention in the conventional if you take the ibuprofen it is going to have only analgesic action it is going to have like uh, analgesic anti inflammatory activity it is going to have and also it will relieve from fever okay these are the three uh, pharmacological effects of the ibuprofen but now if you take the curcumin as a drug natural drug okay what happens is this curcumin is also going to have this antimicrobial activity anti inflammatory anti antioxidant and anti depressive action so these five actions can be uh, can can also be obtained in the patient so it is going to improve what i want to say is natural drug it is not only target selective but it is going to increase total health well being of the patient is going to be improved because it is it can act on different targets and it will improve the health of the patient so i am not saying that please do not use the conventional no if it is in a like if it is any chronic acute disease yeah you can but for in, for improving your overall total health if you if 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 there is a if there is a chance go for the natural drugs because it act on different organs and it will produce the different health benefits now you can see here there is no side effect that is been involved with the turmeric no side effect is been involved so what is the advantage that is in the drug discovery process it will have less time and less energy and less in, uh, money is been invested and other advantage of the natural products is it is going to improve the overall health benefit now after that natural products introduction i want to tell you about this communicable diseases so what is any communicable diseases as is this in this diagram it is being showing that it can be transmitted from one person it is going to be transmitted from one person to the other person okay it may be through man to man or animal to man or through the environment in through any mode of transmission it is going to be transmitted it is going to be transmitted then the other healthy person is going to be infected now i have taken this uh, diagram from the national health uh, in national health profile of uh, communicable diseases 2017 so if you can see because in the 2000 as we know that there was no pandemic so the data with the covid is not been present over here but if you see what are the different types of chemical uh, communicable diseases it is encephalitis brain fever next uh, diarrheal diseases and also h1 h1n1 virus flu virus hepatitis enteric fever pneumonia okay the big share is being with the pneumonia and also like acute respiratory infection like tuberculosis all these are the communicable diseases that are being present and that is how it is being uh, how it is been affecting the population in india this diagram is for the indian population so this is the communicable diseases nothing but these diseases are transmitted these are the transmittable diseases now what about the non communicable diseases like if non communicable it is not going to be communicated from or transmitted from one person to other person the examples being the hypertension diabetes those are not the communicable diseases the communicable diseases if you see here the diagram it is being showing this uh, like uh, spikes and also this this is nothing but a genetic material 
so in the communicating communicable diseases the genetic material of the microorganism is the most uh, uh, important one that is causing the uh, transmission that is causing the transmission now if uh, i am saying the communicable diseases and uh, we can't uh, forget this uh, villain that is affecting total blow it, uh, total population worldwide population that is the corona covid diseases so i want to show you how it is been affecting the human means what is the pathophysiology involved so if once as a clinical pharmacist i know that this theme is for the clinical pharmacist so i want to make to make sure them that what is the path if you learn what is the pathophysiology involved in the covid 19 diseases then you can come up with the different new ideas where you can actually target the molecules uh, target the virus okay so uh, this diagram is been uh, done by my one of my student uh, margaret apke uh, so this is the multiply how the multiplication of covid virus will occur uh, occur in the human cell so what happens when the corona virus enters so what happens into our body so this the, this diagram is depicting that so once this corona virus is been infected or it is been inhaled that will enter and that will enter into the lungs in the lungs it is going to bind the receptors where these receptors are being present that is nothing but pneumonocyte cell this is all together a cell this is a cell so this corona virus it is going to bind on to the receptor that is present in this cell what are those receptor that is nothing but ace2 receptor and also it is it, it is the tmprss so it is nothing but transmembrane protease serine protease enzyme so these two are being involved in the attachment of this corona virus okay as i'm saying it is this is is the, this is the place where the corona virus is going to be attached to the cell now once it is being attached to the cell through the endocytosis mechanism it will enter into the cell so this is going to be the entering into the cell after entering into, into the cell the lipid bilayer that is the that is shown in the pink color that is going to be get dissolved after getting this all whatever that nucleic material that is being present that is going to be released that is nothing but single stranded rna now this single stranded rna is the uh, is the what villain here that is involved in the production of this uh, coronaviruses so once this uh, single stranded rna is released that will go and bind to this ribosomes these ribosomes are present in the cytoplasm and also this uh, endoplasmic reticulum rough endoplasmic reticulum so this uh, single stranded rna when this is being uh, attached to the ribosomes after that protein synthesis occurs then that will lead to the formation of this polyprotein as we have seen the diagram in this uh, coronavirus these are the spikes these are not only for the uh, what uh, Uh, for decorative purpose they have not been used it is the spikes those spikes are these proteins those spikes are nothing but the protein molecules so that protein molecules are going to be that protein molecules are going to be synthesized from the single stranded rna after the proteins are been synthesized then what happens is also this single stranded rna will also synthesizes this rna dependent rna polymerase okay this polymerase and this proteins this polymerase will involved in the production of new rnas new rnas now we are the polyproteins this rna they will combine and enter into the golgi complex produce the new corona viruses this is how the multiplication occur in the pneumonocyte cell i hope it is clear with everyone that nothing uh, nothing much more here but much more is happening inside the cell this is what happening inside the cell is it is binding then it is producing the proteins and also synthesizing the rnas then new viruses are being generated that is going to that is going to do the whole damage cascade mechanism are going to be done so after the release of this new virus what is happening further so this is the Uh, don't go with the complicated picture. I am going to make it easy for you. Uh, just uh, listen to me. Like listen my words. That once the corona viruses that are being new corona viruses are being generated, that is going to infect the type one pneumonocyte cells and type one pneumonocyte cells one and two. 
where these pneumocyte cells are present that is nothing but alveoli okay that is going to be present in the alveolar that nothing but the part of the lungs so these pneumocytes when they are being infected with this coronavirus that is going to be releasing this interferons okay now these interferons what is happening is it is going to damage this pneumocytes one okay type 1 pneumocyte cells one that will release the antiviral peptide now here our immunity mechanism will act upon now if you have enough antiviral peptides that are being synthesized then that virus is going to be uh, uh, not multiplicated that cascade mechanism is not going to be occurring but our if our antiviral immunity is not that much uh, level which can uh, which can degrade the virus then what happening is these interferons will uh, will go and attach to this macrophages these macrophages what they will release is the interleukins interferons and also tumor necrosis factor so what the, what happens when these inflammatory mediators were being released so if, if you see the pathophysiology everywhere you will you will see about the uh, release of cytokine storm cytokine storm it is nothing but a cytokine storm this is the cytokine storm that is happening because that macrophages are going to release this okay so once it is being released what is what that macrophages and all these interferons uh, and uh, cytokines will do is they will damage the pulmonary capillary okay that is a pulmonary capillary you know that it is going to try that that capillary is being involved in the uh, transfer transmission of oxygen and carbon dioxide so this will damage this pulmonary capillary endothelial cells once this capillary endothelial cells is damaged whatever the fluid that is being present that will is going to be released outside this capillary and that causes edema so once the fluid is being released what happens that sulfur tension will increase no now the oxygen that cannot enter into the capillaries nor the carbon dioxide will release and enter into the lungs for the exhalation of gases so if there is no transport of or exchange of gases okay what happens that leads to the shortness of breath that leads to shortness of breath and also that will leads to respiratory acidosis because as the carbon dioxide as, as oxygen is not coming out, coming inside the pulmonary capillary and carbon dioxide is not releasing what happens that will lead that will lead to the build up of the carbon dioxide inside the pulmonary capillaries that will lead to the formation of carbonic acid H plus ions are going to be formed that leads to H plus is nothing but acid that will cause the acidity that will causes the as acidosis that respiratory acidosis. Now that's the one symptom shortness of breath. Why the shortness of breath? The shortness of breath is due to less exchange of gases because the inflammatory mediators has damaged this capillary. Okay, that's one thing. now coming to that after once this type 1 and type 2 our alveolar cells has been damaged what happened that leads to shortness of the breath once the shortness of breath is been done the inside the alveoli neutrophils are also going to be generated these neutrophils further they are going to damage this type 1 type 2 pneumocytes okay in this process leukotrienes and prostaglandins are being released so what are the inflammatory mediators here interleukins are released tumor necrosis factor interferons has been released leukotrienes has been released and also the prostaglandins has been released so what this leukotrienes are going to do is they are going to uh, what stimulate the vagus 10th nerve of the central nervous system that will once this uh, once this once this vagus nerve is being stimulated that will cause cough so the second symptom that cough that is being produced is due to the stimulation of vagus nerve by this inflammatory mediators now the third one is the fever as the prostaglandins pge2 pge2 is the prostaglandins that is being involved in the fever that is involved in the fever so that will go and uh, what uh, in the brain it is going to activate or stimulate then that causes the fever so these are the three symptoms that are being we have we have been seeing the in the corona patients that is nothing but the shortness of breath cough and fever this is how in short you want to you have to just remember one thing that it is due to 
cytokine storm that are that is been happened due to the damage of this pneumocyte cell now we know the pathophysiology some extent to the some extent we have learned about the pathophysiology if you see this is the attachment this is been released these are been damaged now once you know the pathophysiology you can look out for the drugs that are going to have an impact in the treatment of diseases now as the inflammatory mediators are being released okay now we can see that the anti inflammatory drugs can be used but this is not that much simple we have to clinically verify it because as jp sir in the introduction uh, he has said that many number of drugs has been bombarded on the patient if you see hydrochloroquine hcq first it was said that it is useful but again it is been banned now even remedies were now who has also taken this remedies from the list, list of this uh, medication so if you know the pathophysiology very well as a clinical pharmacist as a pharmd student then you can and know that what are the different targets that you can uh, ha have uh, an impact to treat the disease now where my natural drugs are been coming up in the treatment of this diseases so here if you see down regulation if you see the first uh, here examples have also been given so this is the down regulation first mechanism of action of this herbal drugs is down regulation of ace2 receptor now we can see this is the ace2 re receptor that is where the coronavirus is been been uh, binding now if it is been down regulated means down regulation means if it is synthesized less then there is no binding of this coronavirus over here so this is how we can treat so down down regulation of ace2 re receptors the molecules that are the natural drugs that are being involved is the quercetin and this linohua tungur it is the tra traditional chinese medicine this is one of the mechanism the second mechanism that is being involved is the disruption of this microtubules if you know in the <clears throat> if you know the mitosis meiosis process where the uh, where the multiplication of the cells are being done so in the multiplication of cells uh, the, during this uh, i think anaphase or prophase the microtubules are been involved so that disruption of microtubules if we do that meiosis process is going to be decreases so there is no viral viral multiplication so that well known disruption microtubule depression uh, disruption is through the colchicine so it is also these all the herbal drugs are I, i must say that these are in the clinical trials now these are been done in the clinical trials it is not that i have come up with the uh ideas no this has been uh in the clinical trials so well known uh, anti like disruption of uh, microtubules with the colchicine so that mechanism is being studied now even this binding the host to the micromolecular target protein and make it available unavailable so what is the macromolecular target protein here He, he, here it is this is the macromolecular target protein pm prss nothing transmembrane protein is serine protease so that is going this ayurvedic kada that is been developed by the csir this is going to block that tmssr uh, protein molecule once it is being binding over this if this kada is going and binding over that then that is not been available for the attachment of this coronavirus next after that viral inhibition is also going to be uh, replication viral replication like i have said that there is a synthesis of uh, this uh, uh, ssrna so this multiplication is being uh, inhibited by this traditional chinese medicine next phagocytosis this is a uh, uh, phagocytosis that is nothing but engulfing of the viruses by the uh, cell so that is being done with the studies are going with the levan what is levan it is a polysaccharide that is being isolated from the bacillus species present in the honey so that is how this is also going to be utilized next also if you see uh, like inhibition of this 3c like protease enzyme that will cause degradation of these proteins these proteins these polyproteins are going to be degraded how these are going to be degraded with this natural drug like quercetin caffeic acid galantine so uh, and another most important one is down regulation of this transmembrane protease serine uh, receptor this is been done by this natural drug that is nothing but propolis extract what is the propolis extract you will be uh, like uh, uh, 
chalk it is nothing but it is a resin where this resin is being obtained from this is being obtained from the honey combs this is being resin produced by the honey bees so taking honey also will decrease the uh, what uh, coronavirus sense uh, uh, transmission because it will down regulate this protein that is being involved in the attachment of this coronavirus so these are the natural drugs that are being involved in the treatment of this uh, coronavirus and these all the drugs are being involved in the clinical trials ongoing the clinical trials now here i want to take about this ayurvedic kala because it is our uh, indian herbal medicine produced and i want to tell you what are the drugs that are being involved in this taken in this ayurvedic kala kala means it is not going to be having a single herbal drug it is a mixture so let's see what is the different type of herbal drugs that are going to be present in this ayurvedic kala and we used in now it is in the clinical trials so that kala involves tulsi everyone know the tulsi haldi jiloi it is nothing but tino tinospor tinospora cardifolia it is in tippatiga in uh, telugu it is known as tippatiga black pepper ginger clove everyone know know this clove cardamom lemon ashwagandha now if you see this ayurvedic kala half of the drugs if you see more than half of the drugs it is present in our kitchen itself so i want to say that our kitchen is not a area with food is only going to prepared it is the area where the immunity is been boosted up so you can say that pharmacy is in our ayurvedic pharmacy is in our kitchen because many of the drugs are being involved in the prevention of this corona virus okay now other traditional now this chinese people are way ahead i must say this is a this is not a good thing but they are way ahead of us in producing this uh, traditional chinese medicine for the covid treatment and they have been very successful as they are giving as this uh, adjuvant also giving as them as adjuvant so these are the some of the uh, traditional chinese herbal medicines that are being involved in the treatment of covid now uh, i hope that everyone know about the pathophysiology and how the drugs are natural drugs mostly herbal drugs are being uh, acting upon so if uh, now these are present in our clinical trials now then how we are being prote uh, protected till date since one and a half year how we are being protected no drug is been released no synthetic drug is been released so how we are being protected it is nothing but prevention okay prevention that maintain our distance and uh, covering up the mask everything that prevention is going on next prophylaxis treatment means everyone is in boosting their immunity okay boost boosting their immunity now the third one is the vaccines okay the third one is the vaccines that are being uh, life saver drugs till date for this corona virus so what are the vaccines the man made is a synthetic no these are also the biological preparations that are being produced to acquire the active immunity it is the biological projection preparation bio means nothing but it is a it is a living so biological preparation that produces the active acquired immunity so how these vaccines are being uh, involved in the treatment so everyone i think most of the students are being above 18 so they have taken one or the other vaccines i vaccines i want to tell them that whatever the vaccines that you have taken what are the composition how it acting and how you how it is being protective so here it is nothing but what are the vaccines how they do work they are going to vaccines are nothing but these are the small amount of the biological preparation that are injected into the human body once this antigen is being injected antigen is nothing but a foreign body that then our body will take this foreign then our body will detect this foreign particle uh, and then it will synthesize the antibodies now these antibodies will uh, attack this antigen this is how we are being protected okay simple thing antigen is been inserted so that our body will say that oh somebody has came inside so we have to protect ourselves so they release the antibodies then then they, they will neutralize this antigens then we are being protected so what are the different types of vaccines that are being available in the market are nothing but the whole virus vaccine nothing but here what they will do whole virus okay they will 
attenuate the whole virus nothing but they will weaken the virus whatever the pathogenicity is being involved in the production of the disease now that pathogenicity is being removed then that is being injected once that that uh, attenuated uh, biological preparation inserted so what our body don't know that uh, this is been attenuated or killed nothing it is seeing that oh somebody has come inside so uh, we have to produce the uh, antibodies so this is how they are going to produce the antibody antibodies once the whole virus is going to be introduced whole virus so here uh, there are the uh, vaccines uh, apart from the covid vaccines uh, yellow fever vaccines measles vaccine influenza and and hepatitis y a these vaccines are being developed as an whole virus vaccine whole virus attenuated don't get panic here the virus is being weakened it is attenuated pathogenicity is been removed so this is one time of vaccine and you know our covaxin that is indigenously built bharat biotech it is the attenuated vaccine means the virus is the vir from they have taken the virus mrna they have they have taken the virus they have attenuated means the pathogenicity is removed then that uh, then that virus is been injected okay so that is one type of vaccine next is the viral vector vaccine what is viral vector vaccine means they do not have that antigen okay not they are don't know not they are having total virus no they are not having virus and they do not have the antigen what they will do is they will modify the virus okay they will modify the virus okay now that modified virus is known as vector that is going to be injected now our body will think it as an foreign antigen then that is going to be produce our antibodies now in the covid vaccines what is that modified virus they are injecting is nothing but the spike proteins are being injected the spikes the proteins that are being present now that spikes are going to be injected that is going to because no rna ssr in a single stranded rna is not injected over here only the spike protein so no multiplication of the virus will occur in that only the spike proteins are being injected where the our body will uh, uh, take it as a foreign particle then our memory cells okay beta b memory cells they will store the information okay these the those antibody formation once this uh, information is been stored then whenever we are infecting with the new viruses those antibodies are being released and then that is going to be neutralized so this ebola virus okay this vaccine is being developed for this ebola virus next protein subunit viruses in what happens in this protein unit sub virus is it is not a injecting whole pathogen like whole vaccine virus okay no here they are going to have the purified pieces of uh, nucleic material okay nucleic material they are going to take the purified pieces of this viruses then they are going to injected into the body so that is nothing but hepatitis b and also this pneumococcal uh, polysaccharide vaccines are being developed with this protein subunit vaccine nucleic acid vaccines are nothing but the whole dna and rna but none of no vaccine is been uh, approved this is one of the idea to develop this vaccine but none of the vaccine is been developed with the whole taking the whole genetic material okay so these are the three different types of vaccines that are being involved now how uh, now whatever the sputnik vaccine moderna vaccine pfizer vaccine covaxin covid shield whatever you are taking what does it contain let's see now this covid shield and sputnik okay this is having this this is not this is nothing but a viral vector vaccine the second one viral vector vaccine where you are going to inserted with this spike gene okay this is the this is the dna material and in this the part of the dna genetic materials is, is involved in the production of this spike protein so that spike protein uh, dna uh, spike sorry spike protein rna uh, is going to be taken and injected then the spikes uh, then those proteins uh, then that is being injected then that is taken as an antigen in our body antibodies are released then it will neutralize the corona covid next the second one is the inactivated virus the covaxin that is uh, our bharat biotech has been de has developed what they have taken is they have taken this genetic material they have in it inactivated totally they have inactivated corona virus 
then that is being the first one the whole virus so the whole virus is being inactivated that is being given now the protein subunit novax this is not have been approved they have taken also this spike protein uh, mixture now in the vaccine novax in that this is also only the spike gene that is being inserted and no along with it is it is going to have adjuvants that will also trigger this immunity mechanism okay so this all the this is all about our uh, this is all about the treat pathophysiology of the corona virus how it is been infecting what is the mechanism that is been involved what are the inflammatory red, uh, mediators that are been produced how the natural drugs are trying to uh, de down regulate it and what are these vaccines that are being developed what are the nuclear material that are being present in the vaccine this is all about the one of the communicable disease uh, which the now the world is suffering from so these are the differences that are that i have been taken from this for this talk and thank you thank you so much everyone now i give the mic to the pravin sir or dharni ma'am yes ma'am thank you for your uh, wonderful session madam we have some uh, queries from our side and uh, okay. especially when it comes to the covid pandemic and all even in uh, from uh, states like tamil nadu and south india they followed uh, so much herbal precautions for uh, yes, managing yes yes so what yes, is your take on uh, how we can develop herbal medicines in future yeah as i have told that in the reverse pharmacology the we have a literature immense literature is been present where the where the plant materials are been uh, present in the treatment of this communicable diseases so if you come up with those literature Kirtikar and Basu is a literature which are of four to five volumes. If you go through that, you will come up with the new, new, new plant materials which are having this anti-infective mechanism. So from there you can get the sources, and that is going to be helpful. It is not only the uh, common drugs like tulsi, cardamom. No, there are many more drugs that are being hidden treasure with us. So that is being helpful in the treatment of the corona. Yes, madam. Thank you so much. And uh, before uh, we conclude, uh, it will be great if you share uh, one or two sentences about uh, Saint Peter's Day or life. Your yeah, that's what I want to the most. I am eagerly waiting for that. Uh, uh, for all the delegates, I want to tell you that I am an alumni of Saint Peter's. I, even not an alumni, even I am an a faculty. I was working as a faculty for two years in the Saint Peter's. It's a it's a place where I have learned. and i also made the children to learn what i have acquired now this is the process that is going on and for the st peter's i want to tell you one thing uh, my story i want to share is uh, it may take 2 minutes but i want to share okay Please, the uh, when the counseling happened now uh, i tried a lot that i didn't get to, but i am not deeming any other college i have not got in any uh, reputed university so i have tried like anything oh i got in the private college okay let's go but after finishing my bfa i said thank god i entered to the right college because whatever the communication skills i have developed it is because of the management jp sir and his interest and you know jp sir is in the mba so he know the well marketing skills so he applied all this marketing skills in our uh, pharmacy then he made us the people who we are now so for the faculty like if i venu sir raj shekhar sir venkateshwar lu sir prabhakar sir these are the people who made me to what i am today so i want to thank uh, st peters for grooming us well so it was the webinars seminars poster presentations that they have involved that they have inculcated in the uh, curriculum it is it is not uh, it is not a extra curricular activity these are the curriculum of the st peters that is the uh, what we can say uh, 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 that made us what we are today so thank you everyone and being an alumni i am coming again to the college thank you thank you so much for giving this opportunity thank you madam we wish you all uh, success in your future in this also thank you thank you thank you so much sir we shall move on to our next session i would like to now request uh, ms shivani ravla assistant professor st peter's institute of pharmaceutical sciences to introduce our next speaker dr prajwala 
A very good morning to all. I'm glad to introduce Dr. Martiti Prajwala, who is the resource person of, of our today's session. Also, I'm proud to share with you that she is an alumni of St. Peter's Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences as she completed her PharmD in the year 2015. Dr. Prajwala, working as a clinical pharmacist at Vijaya Diagnostic from 2018. She has two years of experience as a pharmacologist in clinical pharmacology and clinical audit department at Ashoda Hospital, Hyderabad from April 2016 to uh, July 2018. She handled a team of five members in the preparation and implementation of evidence-based protocols for the treatment and prevention of disease in hospital. She is an active member in Drug Review Committee, committee Pharmacotherapeutic Committee, Infectious Disease Committee, and Antibiotic Control Committee at Ashoda Hospital. Dr. Prajwala uh, mentored auditing projects like uh, param uh, parameters related to the medication errors therapeutic plan reported and suggested the required uh, correlative and preventive actions uh, for the necessary action uh, activities findings. To her credit, she published two papers in American Journal of Pharmacy and Health Research and International Journal of Innovative uh, Innovations in Pharmaceutical Sciences. Finally, I would invite uh, you to start the session now. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Ma'am, please try and throw the headphones. Please remove the headphones from the socket. No, oh, madam, please. Uh... Ma'am, can you see the mobile phone? Hello, Shivani. Shivani. Yes, ma'am. You, you are audible. You are audible. Uh, please uh, switch off your laptop. Yes. Is it clear now? Yes, yes, yes. You are clear. Uh, okay. Can you share the presentation? Yes. Yes, ma'am, we can start. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, hello, delegates. Uh, hello, everyone. Today's topic is antimicrobial resistance. And uh, uh, as told you before, I'm Dr. Prajwala. Uh, worked, uh, worked as a clinical pharma pharmacist in uh, Ashoda Hospitals and currently in Vijaya Diagnostic Center. So let's begin the presentation. Next slide, please. So what are antimicrobials? Uh, antimicrobials includes antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasites. And uh, to, in today's age and day, it is very important to study about this because can you imagine a prescription without this? It's like uh, only in 10 in 100 uh, prescriptions we find without anti antibiotics. So it is at most important to uh, know about antimicrobials and uh, uh, to know how uh, how to prescribe it appropriately and correctly without any side effects or without any uh, resistance and everything. Next slide, please. 
So, uh, antimicrobial resistance occurs when bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasites like change over time. They no longer respond to the drugs that are uh, that normally respond when there isn't any resistance. Uh, so, um, as a result of drug resistance and all that, it is becoming extremely difficult for the doctors to treat the patients. Most of the time, what happens is the patients uh, for regular fever and uh, all that they go to the regular community pharmacies they get uh, all the antibiotics and at the final stage when the fever is not coming down they go to the hospital when at that time that is completely resistant again the resistance is formed leaving doctors no choice with only one or two drugs in spite of having hundreds of antibiotics or antivirals uh, due to this resistance and all that we are left with no choice at all. It is like difficult, extremely difficult. Next slide. So why? Why it is important? Resistance, knowing about the resistance. Antibiotic resistance is affecting about 2.8 million people. This is statistics in the US that is leading to 35,000 people death. Uh, next slide, please. But in India, there is no surveillance until now. There is no national database. There is no uh, proper statistics of uh, resistant antibiotics. Um, and there are no proper data. Uh, but And uh, even there is no national program or uh, quality assured laboratories or no sufficient data analysis is there in India. There are few random studies conducted uh, but there are literally like very few countable like on our fingers. So uh, one such study was conducted uh, by uh, uh, one organization, one private organization. Next slide, please. So if you see this slide, uh, you can see uh, in uh, one uh, in Kolkata, if there are 958 stool samples. 96 percentage this is percentage if you can see properly 96 percentage samples of cholera uh, are resistant to furazol, uh, zolidone, uh, cotrimoxazole and naledixic acid for example imagine uh, if you are uh, without doing any culture and sensitivity test you are giving uh, the uh, antibiotic to the patient cotrimoxazole you are giving to the patient without doing any uh, culture and sensitivity test 96 percent chance of failure for the drug so is there any use to give such a drug so resistance plays at most important role in giving antibiotics and it is important to uh, stop the resistance and uh, to trim, trim our treatment accordingly. And similarly, if you can see uh, uh, in Lucknow, Klebsiella, uh, uh, Klebsiella is resistant for a, around 60-60%. Uh, so, and the list goes on. Next slide, please. Same. Uh, in Mangalore, in 180 clinical samples of enterococcal strains, it is uh, about uh, 16 to 40 uh, percent resistance to amino glycosides. Gram negative pseudomonas, 50 to uh, uh, 66 percent, 76 percent. And these percentages are not anything less. These are so huge and so uh, should be considered uh, as important. Resistance really plays an important role. Next slide, please. So why, how, how this resistance is occurring? So uh, first let's discuss how the mechanisms uh, that's happening in our body. Um, later we can discuss the causes. Uh, for example, if you see uh, in the figure, uh, the normal bacteria, once it applies and we give the drug, the bacteria dies. But the drug resistant bacteria, even upon giving the drug, it doesn't die. It keeps on multiplying until we give uh, the drug which is which for which microorganism is sensitive. Next slide, please. So 
uh, many of the people say like uh, many of the studies say that uh, mutation occurs due to the drugs uh, giving drugs randomly where it might be like for under duration or for over duration or uh, for uh, an appropriate uh, doses or uh, <coughs> an appropriate uh, uh, routes of administration or whatever the case may be so what happens in such cases whenever the bacteria is there in our body uh, we give uh, for example let's say uh, we are giving um, amikacin to a patient and we are giving it in under dose that dose is not sufficient to kill the bacteria so what does the bacteria do it adapts to the drug that is given and it molds itself and it mutates its gene and forms into a drug resistant bacteria so which then multiplies and multiplies and which uh, give, brings us to the situation there that is resistant to many uh, other drugs itself so uh, finding a sensitive drug in such cases is extremely difficult next so there is also another mechanism where uh, there is a gene transfer uh, for example let's say a patient is having multiple infections uh, if the patient is having e coli in um, uh, for example in uti and uh, streptococcus infection in blood so what does that uh, uh, what happens in such cases for example e coli is not resistant to anything but the streptococcus is resistant so in such cases this gene transfer might happen which is leading to <coughs> excuse me which is leading to non resistant um, Dr. Prajala, please unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, uh, seasonal flu and all that. Okay. Mm. Uh, coming to the gene transfer, so in such cases, gene transfer happens, and it is creating not just one strain of resistant organism. but multiple strains of resistant organisms so um it is important to uh, put a break to such mechanisms right in the beginning next slide please so what are the other causes as i told you before inappropriate uh, use be it under dose over dose or uh, be it the duration the lengthy duration or uh, be it the shorter duration all these factors all these factors lead to the resistance and uh, inadequate diagnostics so most of the time in this case for example uh we know that patient is all, all uh, might already be using uh, medications outside and coming to our hospital yet again we don't do any culture and sensitivity but still we give uh, antibiotics upon our interest then it is improper diagnosis it is not right diagnosis so whenever we suspect there is a resistance it is mandatory to do a culture and sensitivity test and then proceed according to the sensitive drugs we acquire so uh, next thing is hospital use okay uh, hospital use here in this sense is hospital acquired infections so uh, actually what happens is patients in the hospital might transmit infections uh, to one another in spite of taking number of precautions in uh, many precautions uh, there is a chance there is a probability is high for the transfer of infections in some or the other way because the same nurse is serving two or three people so it is 
in spite of taking precautions there is a probability because we will be using same equipment to the patients so there is a transfer and most of the time what happens is these are uh, drug resistance because we we will already use drugs to one patient but uh, it turns out to be a drug resistant strain and then it transfers to the other patient so that might also be a cause and uh, one other suspected cause is agricultural use a uh, few studies especially in the us told that the number of antibiotics were used on the agricultural lands which are producing strains resistant strains uh, which enter through uh, to our bodies through food or uh, whatever it is whatever in whichever way it is uh, turning into resistant organisms next slide please so um resistant uh, we, first thing we had to do is uh, we had to identify which are the organisms that are um, being so resi resistant to the drugs so here there is an acronym uh, which makes which gives us like easy way to remember and uh, be alert when we know that the patient is having uh, suffer is suffering from these infections that is uh, escape pathogens uh, e for e stands for enterococcus uh, s stands for staphylococcus klebsiella acinetobacter pseudomonas and enterobacter so um, these organisms these organisms are highly highly uh, these are these are stated uh, not just by uh, four or five studies but there are multiple number of studies conducted all over the world stating that these organisms are more susceptible to drug resistance uh if for example if you do a culture and sensitivity to a patient uh, suffering from these infections we'll hardly find one or two drugs uh, as a choice because <clears throat> the rest of the drugs are resistant so uh, and most of the hospital acquired infections are also these escape pathogens uh next slide please so conditions are uh, requiring longer duration of antibiotic therapy why why longer duration of antibiotic therapy needs to be studied why uh, because uh, let's see as as we have already discussed because uh, longer duration duration matters duration also plays a biovital role uh, in uh, generating resistance so uh, we had to be very keen in diseases where they need longer longer antibiotic therapy um for example immunocompromised patients be it sle or be it cancer patients or uh, aids hiv patients where they need uh, they need longer and longer duration of antibiotic therapy and uh, the pathetic thing is yes these people uh, or oh, are resistance to multiple number of drugs and it is so hard in spite of having numerous and numerous antibiotics it is so hard to choose a drug to keep on for such a long duration uh, Uh, for as a treatment because we need to keep shuffling drugs for after using 14 days put it up uh, put him on another drug and then 14 days put him on another drug and same scenario for the transplant patient imagine pre and post op uh, for example let's a uh, liver transplant only uh, a, a before before the liver transplant we might suspect a Uh, liver infection and all that so we will be uh, put him on antibiotic and post op again surgical in there is a uh, scope of surgical site infections and again he needs antibiotic and again after operation uh, again they, because there is a um, it is a transplant and it is ha it has been uh, uh, allogenic uh, again he, he need to be put on antibiotics for a longer and longer duration of uh, time Uh, under such cases injured patients uh, for example take accidents or um, any uh, any burn patients uh, i have once seen a uh, electrical burn patient in a hospital he his burns were like he is 70% burned and he was put on antibiotics for uh, about 4 months continuously and it is like no choice if we stop the antibiotic the minute he stopped he is into septic septic shock 
so it is at most important and think of such scenarios where uh, it is resistance really plays an important role if there is no resistance there is huge number of a uh, choice multiple choice and we can play with the drugs but if there is resistance the game is over you are you are you should stick to one or two drugs that's it and you had to keep shuffling and shuffling and uh, with uh, with many other complications like renal, renal failure or anything anything um cardiogenic shock and it it makes the scenarios even worse leaving it to the criticality and same same goes with the sepsis patient and uh, here the sepsis patient especially uh, we had to consider uh, immuno uh, like um, pa patients who are uh, diabetic and uh, who are with multiple other uh, diseases so scenarios like these uh, should also be considered and they are important and the last thing is a pneumonia patient especially ventilated uh, let's say a scenario for example a patient uh, admitted with a, um, a cardiac arrest or whatever it is there and he is ventilated not not due to due to any infection or so but he is ventilated and the minute he is ventilated he has to be put on antibiotic because there is a possibility of uh, ventilator acquired pneumonia because ventilator acquired pneumonia uh, probability is high one uh, anything invasive whenever you put something invasive into our body be it uh, ventilator be it catheter be it trial tube something is going into our body invasive antibiotic should be started how how many number of days he is on it and the antibiotic should be continued until uh, those many number of days um so here i just want to give an example uh, a pneumonia a ventilator ventilator uh, ventilator associated pneumonia uh, there was this doctor uh, who happened to observe that uh, ventilated uh, associated pneumonias are so high she started designing a score uh for example uh see uh, antibiotics to give to the patient it has to be trimmed according to the needs so uh she, what's what she has done is um she has designed a score uh, for example be it if he is a diabetic one one point and then uh, if he is already having urinary infection another point if he is on catheter another point so she designs this score and uh, giving her for the final probability of infection whether he is high susceptible to infection or low susceptible to infection and uh, this this research of her was uh, published in papers as well actually why i brought this point is i want to tell you how um, even doctors needs help at uh, these critical levels if we as a pharmd students as a clinical pharmacist can enter into their shoes and think like this and uh, give out um, uh, give out or find out solutions to such critical things uh, we will be like uh, they they'll appreciate us not just doctors management and even uh, we will be recognized on many levels so that's why this uh, i just want to share this point and uh, next slide please so restricted antibiotics uh, what are restricted antibiotics um restricted antibiotics are not the uh, regular antibiotics that we get in the um, uh, community pharmacy the, these are high end antibiotics when the doctors uh, literally uh, had uh, lost the chance to use all the regular antibiotics they go on to this restricted antibiotics in hospital what happens is they maintain a list of restricted antibiotics uh, nabh national uh, board of accreditation for hospitals and healthcare professionals clearly stated guidelines how to use this restricted antibiotics uh, because same uh, to stop the antibiotic resistance all over uh, these accreditation boards had come up with a uh, few regulations on using antibiotics so for example what happens is whenever a doctor want to prescribe a restricted antibiotic for say uh, carbapenems 
इमिपिनम मेरोपिनम और कोलिस्टिन ऑल दीज ड्रग्स ऑल दीज ड्रग्स आर रेस्ट्रिक्टेड एंटीबायोटिक्स वेन एवर डॉक्टर वॉन्ट टू प्रिस्क्राइब दिस दिस पर्टिकुलर ड्रग्स टू द पेशेंट ही हैज टू गिव अ जस्टिफिकेशन वील बी हैविंग जस्टिफिकेशन फॉर्म्स इन द हॉस्पिटल सो वेन एवर डॉक्टर वॉन्ट टू Uh, prescribe this he'll fill up the justification form uh, give the justification why he want to prescribe particular drug to the patient what is the reason behind uh, he might say that i have uh, then there are no other uh, antibiotics they all other antibiotics are resistance we had performed cultural sensitivity test we have found that um, these uh, antibiotics are resistant so we want to give this to the patient because he is critical he is so and so uh, and we had no other option and all this description will be given by the doctor with duration how many days he is planning to prescribe to this uh, patient is this duration also mentioned and he signs and give it to the pharmacist and this record these justifications were the uh, justification forms will be maintained uh, at the pharmacy which were audited during nabh time nabh audits will be performed regularly uh, every 2 years uh, so uh, as uh, in, as uh, these pharmacy colleges and in engineering colleges go for accreditations same way hospitals go for accreditations and uh, when these uh, people go for accreditations uh the accreditation uh, people who have come for audit in abh or jci whatever it is uh, they see all these points whether the hospital is maintaining its standards maintaining its uh, um, all these documentations and uh, all these uh, the therapeutic guidelines properly or not so all these were audited during nabh time and they audit these restricted uh, justific antibiotics justification forms also at the time of nabh so uh, actually the thing to tell you all this is there are certain uh, um, procedures even uh, to prescribing antibiotics in the view of restricting the uh, and uh, antibiotics usage to pull down resistance of antibiotics next slide please so uh, these are the list of restricted antibiotics as i have told you uh, this list varies from hospital to hospital um, so uh, actually there will be committees in the hospital for example antibiotic control committee infectious disease control committee pharmacotherapeutic committee so all these committees um this list is maintained by antibiotic control committee they, uh, they the committee come together sit down and they discuss what uh, antibiotics to restrict usage and uh, what need not be uh, so even they discuss whenever there is a new antibiotic in the market how far it can be used and in what scenarios it can be used uh, they sit and discuss to, uh, together and um, Uh, bring out a newsletter so it will be circulated throughout the hospital to all the doctors telling that these drugs should be restricted or this new drug can be used according to the need of the patients this is all for the benefit uh, of the patient and uh, and to increase the efficacy of drugs to say in particular because uh, resistance uh, is a uh, literally a big challenge a huge challenge to doctors because it is limiting the choice imagine for example a patient uh, a patient is having uh, renal failure at on one point and uh, high infection on the other point and there is uh, resistance of drugs of the uh, to the strain on one point the already the choice is less and the patient is suffering from renal failure the dose has to be adjusted for drugs like colistin and all that there is a, a high probability of uh, again effect on the renal system so see uh, having in spite of having hundreds and hundreds of antibiotic the choice has literally come down so it is important to uh to trim and uh, maintain according to the need and only prescribe when it is really 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 necessary next slide please so common errors in antibiotic usage so um 
uh, this slide mostly emphasizes on what uh, uh, errors can happen in antibiotic usage in spite of taking multiple and multiple precautions in multi specialties and super specialty hospital there is a huge chance of uh, things going wrong um uh, being myself working in nabh and uh, uh, nabl accredited healthcare centers they really follow each and every point mentioned in the nabh guidelines to meet up to the expectations to meet up to the qualities but still the one or the other way uh, at times things go wrong so these are such uh, things uh, of course considered rare but still should be uh, taken into account uh, wrong dose of drugs um, be it uh, for example some uh, one person need high dose of antibiotic 1000 mg of uh, uh, ceftriaxone but he was prescribed only for 500 mg uh, errors like that dilution errors uh, for example it has to be diluted in uh, 100 ml uh, colistin has to be diluted in 100 ml of uh, nacl but it is diluted only in 50 ml uh, and it is given at uh, 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 speed of uh, speed of like in 10 minutes which has to be given for one hour again it is a error because the patient might suffer his bp might fluctuate high and down uh, for normal people like us bp fluctuations uh, might be normal but imagine a patient is in intensive care unit and if his uh, bp fluctuations happen it is a huge crisis so errors cannot be tolerated at any cost even 1% or even 0.1% is an error and it hasn't it shouldn't be uh, done or shouldn't be tolerated because the patient is at risk and uh, um the patient is our high priority okay the another error is using restricted antibiotic for surgical profile access see uh, for surgical surgeries uh, because we might consider uh, there are surgical site infection risk we we should prescribe antibiotics to avoid such scenarios but prescribing high end antibiotic to that is not necessary so that is an error and it should be avoided uh using restricted antibiotics without culture and sensitivity test reports so uh, as i told you before restricted antibiotics should be uh, given only after culture and sensitivity uh, for example uh, you have performed a urine culture and sensitivity and there is this klebsiella uh, 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 organism uh it is uh, uh you had to then you had to then give meropenem or uh, targosid or whatever it is like that but without culture and sensitivity test you shouldn't prescribe resistance uh, drugs are continued even on the arrival of culture and sensitivity reports so what happens is when the patient admits in the hospital uh, initially uh, we know that the patient is suffering from the infection we give uh, whatever the antibiotic uh, for example magnex foot uh, cefiran mm, salbactam uh, we give to the patient and uh, we give at the, on the same day we send the samples to the uh, lab for the culture and sensitivity report uh, but obviously culture and sensitivity report takes 3 uh, uh, days to uh, come if it is urine 3 days if it is blood it might take uh, around 5 to 7 days so in the meantime you uh, you couldn't just uh, leave the patient you will obviously put him on an antibiotic but even after receival of the culture and sensitivity you are continuing the same antibiotic knowing that it is resistance then it is a mistake Uh, and uh, not adjusting antibiotic dose according to lft or rft as discussed before we had to consider uh, uh, renal failure and all these things we had to consider all the laboratory parameters and then adjust the dose accordingly uh, next uh, blood cultures or urine culture should be done depending on focus of infection so uh, i'll tell you what this point is meant um, for example the patient is having U uti urinary tract infection but the nurse comes and take endotracheal uh, uh, line of swab and goes and performs the test obviously uh, she uh, she will find she will find normal thing and uh, every drug is sensitive but the infection is in the urinary tract um 
so that is a mistake and guys these things were observed in the hospital these are not just a uh, suppository uh, um the statements these things are observed in the hospital and these things happen uh, on minute scale of course but even on the minute scale we had to stop these things so that's why i just want to emphasize it uh, and uh, the other thing is using two different class of antibiotics with same same spectrum uh uh example for example uh, cefepirod and uh, torgosid the same patient is given both the drugs thinking um it might like there might be uh, acting well but no there is a therapeutic duplication and not necessary to give why you want to give two drugs when you want when you can cut it down to one and it if it is acting perfectly why you want to give two again you are increasing the scope of resistance for the future right so it is not necessary at all so uh, guys why i want to uh, emphasize like uh, give significance to this slide is as a pharmacist as a clinical pharmacist especially our role is here exactly right here because uh, in a country like india we are not given the choice to choose antibiotics uh, to the patient unlike abroad because there was everything systematically uh, the doctor just writes antibiotic in the prescription and uh, the pharmacist get the chance to choose the drug according to patient needs according to all uh, uh, renal adjustments or dose adjustments or whatever it is it is in the uh, pharmacist hands in other countries but here in india uh, it might take another uh, 10 or 20 years for that time to come but until then our our role lies especially here to detect prescription errors to detect uh, antibiotic usage errors to detect nursing errors all these errors our job especially uh, is here because um, as a clinical pharmacist uh, i maintain a record of all these things i maintain a track of all these things and i perform regular regular audits audits is nothing but checking uh, checking of all these uh, we set a few parameters and we keep checking all these uh, uh, parameters regularly and if something is going wrong we take to the notice of doctors if it is nursing error we take to the notice of nursing people if nothing is happening with these people we go it to the management level and um, we were given that that part of authority uh, so we maintain a record of all this and after taking after taking track of all this uh, we suggest corrective and preventive action so what can be done to uh, uh, things not going this way what can, what preventive action can be taken will be suggested by us and we had to see that even that preventive action is being implemented properly so our duty is that so we maintain all this we maintain track of these errors we maintain corrective and preventive action if it is done properly or not so whenever the audits are performed we we are responsible we as a clinical pharmacist are responsible to uh, nabh people we sit and tell them we have performed these audits we had uh, suggested this corrective and preventive action and uh, these things had happened and our hospital has maintained the quality at its top notch and everything is recorded and you can have this records so this is the way things happen in the hospital and we um uh, show these records to nih people and then they give the accreditations to the hospital which is at most important thing for the hospitals because that's uh, that determines nbh accreditation or jc accreditation or whatever these accreditations determine the uh, quality of the healthcare that the hospital is producing that the hospital is giving to the patient so uh, next slide please uh prevention uh of course <coughs> so uh, obviously we had discussed a lot until now uh, prevention is uh, uh, um in actually if if we are to ask me it is in the hands of the people patients because uh, they shouldn't go for antibiotics even for the health minor uh, min minor problems so that leaving no choice at all to the doctors or even in for the for the matter of fact to pharmacists so 
uh, it has to be up to the people but uh, these are there are other few uh, relevant preventive measures so strengthening of surveillance data it is always important to maintain uh, data of anything uh, because if you are maintaining statistics you will know how important the situation is and uh, how important to take into the grip of that situation or uh, or that disease so uh, of course there isn't any uh, statistical data appropriately in india till now but uh, hopefully in future uh, and uh, setting up a standard operating guidelines of course uh, our drug council has uh, issued many guidelines uh, for the um, community pharmacies in uh, prescri- in um, uh, giving up uh, antibiotics uh, as um, over the counter uh, but still there are loopholes and uh, that has to be set right uh, improvement in antibiotic prescription practices all the medication errors that we discussed uh, comes under this uh, restricting the over <coughs> <coughs> restricting the over the counter sales of uh, antibiotics controlling poor sanitization um, endemic infections malnutrition malnutrition uh, improving public awareness if you were to ask me this is the most important thing than anything else on the list and of course coordination and uh, fragmentation of efforts next slide please uh antimicrobial resistance poses significant challenge of course uh, until now we had discussed how uh, multiple uh, comorbidities and multiple uh, conditions literally many things uh, pulled pull us down to no choice at all at last so that condition is far worse because we have multiple drugs but yet we are unable to use any uh, which is a uh, pathetic situation and uh, so it is important to regulate use of antibiotics is what i can say um so i am open to questions guys if you have any anything related to hospital anything related to clinical pharmacy or anything related to antibiotic resistance yes dr pajana that's what, that was a wonderful session so our uh, query from our side is what are your opinion on uh, adopting antimicrobial switch uh, it uh, it can be adopted but um, most of the time uh, actually what happens is um, every hospital maintains its own set of uh, guidelines so it is um, it depends on uh, like multiple factors because you have uh, many senior doctors sitting in there and many guidelines given by the nabh and they consider all these factors uh, then merely uh, calling it as stewardship so it is um, what to say and uh, like for example there are many new drugs being released into the market uh, the super specialty hospitals like ashoda or apollo whatever it is the new product comes into the market e- even just after the release even at the, in the us uh, these people are lucky to have it in the hospital based upon the priority so it is uh, mostly uh, upon to the uh, like infection control uh, department or um antibiotic control team and all that yes doctor pajala thank you uh, it would be great if you share some of your experiences about cnp uh yes of course uh, um to say firstly i am proud uh, that i am a student of st peters because uh, uh, it is my personal experience to tell you that uh, our batch our batch of st peters were more competitive than any other batch or uh, of any other colleges because uh, we were placed in one of like many reputed hospitals we are, our batch were in kims uh, uh, ashoda apollo and it is not so easy because uh, mine is second batch to enter into the hospital sector with just the internship knowledge without any prior experience uh, we were able to survive I, i'm not saying excellence uh, able to survive in such a huge uh, environment with a huge knowledge of like because 
you you see only dm and all those doctors there are fine dr prajula there is some technical issues thank you for your wonderful session and we wish you all the good luck in your future endeavors also now we, we shall move on to our final session uh, i would like to request uh, ms manasri naraidla assistant professor st peter's institute of pharmacy to thank us to introduce our final speaker dr nagar kapoor Thank you sir good afternoon everyone i am very happy to introduce dr mriganka pal one of our proud alumni he is currently working as aggregate reports analyst at pfizer india private limited he also has experience as drug safety associate in nova nordisk private india private limited india he, dr mriganka pal is a family graduate from st peter's institute of pharmaceutical sciences he worked as a public relations officer for one year for indian pharmaceutical association student forum and he was also a member for working committee in 64th ipa and second ipa student forum balandar dr mriganka pal represented st peters at 21st annual ispar meeting held at washington dc he has delivered various posters and oral presentations at many conferences and published various international journals he was awarded as best poster presentation at ispar 7th asia pacific conference singapore Now I request Dr. Mriganka to please start the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manushu. Uh, could you confirm if I am audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. So, uh, thanks a lot for giving this uh, opportunity uh, to Saint Peter's. Uh, I would like to quickly start my session. Uh, so, Dr. Manushu, uh, can you share the screen? Yes, yeah, sure. The slide. okay uh so uh thank you thank you one and all uh thanks for giving me this opportunity today uh, and giving this uh, platform to uh, have this uh, uh, presentation so i am riganka pal uh, aggregate report analyst working in pfizer uh, would be talking on role of pharmacist in uh, infectious disease management i i believe that uh, the previous uh, two sessions especially uh, the session by dr prajwala uh, she has uh, covered most of the and in very uh, in detail uh, about how a clinical pharmacist should work in a hospital setting so uh, i'll not take much time on this uh, but uh, i would also touch upon few of the important aspects uh, when you work in industry also next slide please so today's uh, uh, presentation would have this agenda of uh, introduction infectious disease management is the need of the hour uh, why an infectious disease pharmacist is required professionals who are involved you might already know from dr prajwala's uh, uh, presentation who are the professionals involved in the infectious disease management uh, what are the roles of pharmacist in infectious disease uh, management then uh, antimicrobial stewardship i would uh, just give a brief actually what exactly it is and then the, what all uh, the practice sites where a clinical pharmacist is required or can practice uh, how a clinical pharmacist can contribute to uh, uh, infectious disease management and clinical pharmacist uh, salaries which is most important actually in india and uh, if at all any questions are there so uh, next slide please <coughs> next please so uh, it is of utmost importance actually uh, uh, that uh, Uh, that compared to the past in current scenario uh, uh, the regulation and to improve the clinical outcomes in the management of infectious disease related to the patient especially who are of critical condition such as septic shock fungal infections uh, having uh, sepsis as uh, a few other uh, critical conditions which uh, even dr prajula mentioned about uh, hiv and all that uh, that we need to uh, monitor the uh, Uh, what do you call uh, treatment so uh, okay so the working logic is to manage the use of uh, current or available antimicrobials effectively so as to uh, minimize the scope of multi drug resistance so uh, today uh, it is of uh, uh, utmost importance that uh, there is a active and permanent presence of a clinical pharmacist as a part of the core medical team 
uh, which i believe in india not many hospitals are having but uh, there is a awareness uh, in certain hospitals and uh, this is a positive sign uh, because it is related to patient's health next slide please so why infectious disease management is uh, the need of the hour? uh most uh, there are many many reasons but uh, i would be discussing the uh, very important ones also of late uh, the uh, you know, there is uh, uh, different uh, antibiotics coming up i believe but uh, they are actually very fewer in number so the newer uh, anti antimicrobial molecules which are produced are very few so uh, there might be a chance of saturation in future uh, that or there might be a chance that uh, we are not left with much antibiotics uh, and then uh, wide spec wide spectrum uh, antimicrobial abuse contributes to the multiple drug resistance uh, since uh, the due, uh, with the advent of the newer drugs uh, there is a uh, resistance which is uh, uh, developing so what happened is that uh, with the newer drug coming up uh, there is a, a tendency that uh, the older drugs are forgotten and neither this older drugs are actually tested with the resistant patterns so here is the here is a, a chance where we can improvise and we can bring in this uh, older uh, antimicrobials and try and test it on the resistant pattern so uh, so uh, this is one uh, another point uh, then abuse of uh, some crucial antimicrobials uh in out in outpatient setting in india it is especially uh, over the counter sales then uh, the best example of migration and diffusion of infectious disease is the current scenario we are facing of uh, corona virus and uh, and lastly to manage the cost even there is a cost burden uh, on the uh, on the community when you are using the newer antibiotics which are little bit expensive than the older ones next slide please yeah next slide. yeah uh, no no the previous one thank you so uh, why an infectious disease pharmacist is required so uh, i i do not have to go through this whole whole slide or i need not have to say because uh, so much has been shared by dr prajwala on why a clinical pharmacist is required and how much extent uh, a clinical pharmacist can contribute towards uh, management of infectious disease uh, I, I i mean i really appreciate uh, the amount of work they are putting in uh, in the hospital settings uh, so yeah so i would but i would just to touch upon uh, clinical pharmacists can provide the physicians with the very necessary inputs pertaining to the selection of drugs which would ultimately improve the clinical outcomes uh, reduce the toxicity maintain the cost and also uh, preserve the potential of the antimicrobials uh, uh, of their antimicrobial uh, Uh, uh possibilities next slide please so uh, we already know uh, these are the professionals uh, uh, who are there uh, in infectious disease management physicians clinical pharmacists with expertise in uh, antimicrobial stewardship antimicrobial stewardship i'll be talking a little bit in uh, detail in the next slide microbiologist epidemiologist epidemiologist is very much essential uh, just to uh, as uh, again dr prajbala was mentioning about the data uh, that we have to maintain so epidemiologist and the statistical data analyst are very important in uh, maintaining or creating that data uh, uh, which would be coming out of from the uh, hospital setting and also uh, not to forget the uh, nurses next slide uh, yeah so uh, the, uh, i mean Uh, if you see this uh, uh, image of the uh, doctor selecting the cards, if you uh, if you uh, presume that each card is one antibiotic, so this is what actually it used to be in the uh, a decade ago. That uh, uh, most of the time you are they are just uh, picking a card or guessing a anti uh, antibiotic or antimicrobial. So uh, this is where the problem started and. Uh, Uh, this is where a clinical pharmacist expertise is required so um, in uh, in us i believe uh, i am not sure if uh, the antimicrobial stewardship program is there in india right now so in us uh, 
after the pg uh, after uh, completion of uh, farm d uh, there is residency pg y1 and pg y2 uh, i believe antimicrobial stewardship those who are taking the rotation or the expertise of uh, uh, residency in infectious disease management they have a uh, curriculum of antimicrobial stewardship where uh, they take uh, uh, they are actually trained uh, on uh, vigorously on how, uh, on how to uh, manage the infectious disease uh, manage the infectious diseases and also be a part of a multidisciplinary team so uh, and in uh, why th this is required this is uh, just an example from the us data that 70% of the necessary prescription which are there uh, prescribed in us still uh, it is said that still it is, it requires improvement in uh, drug selection dose and duration whereas 30% of the drugs which are prescribed are not necessary so uh, uh, i believe the scenario is much more uh, different in india also because uh, with such a uh, systematic and streamlined process in us after that also there are 30 percentage of uh, unnecessary prescriptions so here uh, even the over the counter uh, sales uh, can uh, uh, can uh, give a very different uh, number so this is where the clinical uh, pharmacist uh, antimicrobial stewardship uh, is uh, uh, required because uh, next please uh, yeah so to select the right drug at the right time and then uh, the to check on the doses uh, frequency and the duration of the uh, drugs uh, check for the interactions and then uh, culture monitoring agriculture and sensitivity uh, test monitoring and also uh, the patient counseling patient counseling is another uh, one of the important aspect of antimicrobial stewardship because uh, in current scenario uh, uh, the doctors are uh, routine is such that they are very much uh, tighten up and they have very limited time to educate the patient uh, where day by day the the patients are actually getting smarter uh, especially with the uh, so much information available on google and on whatsapp university that uh, patients are now uh, nowadays feeling having a feeling that uh, they can treat themselves so uh, how they do it i'll just give an example uh, uh, example is of uh, one of my uh, relative uh, initially he was uh, treated with uh, uh, azithromycin uh, by a uh, clinic clinician uh, in a local clinic uh, and uh, he was treated for throat irritation throat irritation and he had developed some sort of throat infection and that's why he was uh, treated so uh, what he did is uh, on the he, he was given a, a certain uh, uh, dose of uh, antibiotic uh, and uh, the uh, and uh, he was asked to complete the antibiotic full dosage uh, but he felt a relief after a second day or third day and he he feels that uh, he is cured now and he can uh, he can stop the drug and he stopped the drug so this is where the problem creates or arises and, and this is where the roots are so if you are if the clinical pharmacist are uh, uh, educating the patient so that awareness is spreaded and that's why community pharmacy is also very much essential next please So uh, already covered uh, this point, uh, uh, but I would like to touch upon the evidence. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I would like to touch upon the evidence-based information that the uh, clinical pharmacists provide us, uh, uh, just to select the appropriate uh, antimicrobial in the hospital settings. Next, please. So uh, there are uh, uh, there are different practice sites, uh, starting from clinics, uh, inpatient hospitals, and. pharmacy practice graduates do uh, but there are uh, and how they uh, practice you you would have uh, no no uh, can you go to the previous slide uh, yeah so how how they do uh, uh, in uh, clinic uh, hospital settings and clinics and all that uh, this this was discussed uh, very extensively by uh, dr prajwala uh, but i would like to stress upon how uh, a clinical pharmacist is uh, or clinical pharmacist expertise is uh, important in pharmaceutical companies so uh, here the role is little bit of 
a little bit different uh you would be doing more of the analytical or you'll be using your uh, knowledge uh, in analysis of the data which has been uh, coming out uh, from the uh, actual field of study or uh, actual uh, or post marketed uh, uh, studies so uh, or also uh, spontaneously uh, so uh, the irony is that even though we work in pharmaceutical companies we have very less data coming out from our own country so most of the data which uh, we process or which we analyze or uh, we check up on are uh, from different other countries mainly uh, developed countries and nowadays uh, to be shocked even developing countries or uh, under developed to developing countries like bangladesh are also very uh, putting stress on uh, uh, the data driven process uh, of healthcare management so uh, i think we should step on the gas and uh, we should uh, start uh, developing data uh, and this can be only possible by clinical pharmacists uh, putting a effort uh, in the hospital care settings uh, so that uh, the data is there in the in, there for analysis and how the analysis is done uh, in uh, um, uh, industrial setting is that uh, the data raw data is uh, sent to us uh, or sent to the company and uh, uh, it might be in different forms uh, it might be uh, handwritten or it might be in uh, uh, through an app as uh, many uh, company many countries have developed or it might be uh, in a uh, in a email format or in a fax format or something so uh, those are actually uh, uh, entered in the system as icsr and then uh, once the icsr case processing is done after that uh, the aggregate report writers uh, uh, analyze all the icsrs for a particular period of time and then uh, the te uh, technical uh, analysis happens and then we decide whether uh, the uh, causality assessment and all that so uh, this is how uh, but the clinical knowledge to analyze this data is much more important and this can be only provided by a clinical pharmacist uh mostly next slide please so uh, coming uh, coming to how a pharmacist can contribute to the uh, infectious disease management uh there are many points which are uh, covered uh, extensively by dr prajwala with very good examples uh, like uh, the resistance uh, and which all uh, drugs are interacted uh, which all drugs should be regulated and how but there are certain points i would like to uh, stress upon like uh, health and uh, health nation and local policies so different countries will be having different uh, uh, policies health policies uh, which sometimes are uh, a hindrance uh, for selecting the drug even uh, so sometimes if it is not there in the list or if this is not covered uh, under the insurance so uh patients mostly uh, ten, are are reluctant to take the drug because this is not covered and he has to pay from his own pocket so uh this is one of a, one of the reason and then uh, prophylaxis and isolation measure and decontaminate measure sterile procedure and as we discussed antimicrobial stewardship uh, next please so also uh Uh, protect uh, protect the penicillin use uh, new formulation like uh, liposomal amphotericin to reduce the nephrotoxicity choosing therapy according to the patient's pathology as uh, uh, dr bajwala was men also mentioning about uh, that uh, how you need to monitor uh, the uh, 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 monitor the drugs uh, especially for uh, populations uh, renal failure populations or uh, or hepatic failure populations how you need to tap at the drug or how you need to switch in between two uh, antibiotics so stuff like that and uh, a clinical pharmacist has that uh, deeper knowledge of toxicity and uh, related to drugs pharmacokinetics and uh, pharmaco pharmacology uh, which will help in uh, monitoring such stuffs and also using icu prescription process traceability monitoring the microbiological data and antibiotics next please uh no uh, can you go to the previous one the previous one yeah so uh, and also uh, 
if uh, a clinic a clinical pharmacist being part of the rapid uh, uh, lab response team is also very essential especially in the current scenario i would take the example of a uh, of the scenario which are which we are facing now of coronavirus uh, where uh, prompt action is very much required for quick uh, detection of uh, the patient condition or uh, diagnosis and then uh, putting the patient into isolation ward so a clinical pharmacist has that potential or that uh, 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 merit uh, where the, the he or she can connect uh, with different levels of uh, the, the multidisciplinary team or uh, infectious of infectious disease management and then uh, can uh, expedite the process uh, apart from that stop therapy where it is uh, stop the therapy where it is necessary of uh, uh, pasolacy adjustment if it is required to change from parenteral to oral uh sometimes doctor might miss on all this uh so this is where the expertise again comes into picture uh procedure uh, protocols guideline evidence based uh, medicine uh, synergistic association checking for synergistic associations and associations uh, dangers for example uh, two nephrotoxic drugs uh, has been uh, given to the same patient so stuff like that and and uh, next slide please so again uh, renal failure patients we already discussed uh, antimicrobial to be used only if prophylaxis is needed uh, or infectious uh, infection is still persistent also check for uh, uh, off label usage registered usage of a drug which is very much essential uh, currently and uh, drugs uh, limitation use uh, strategy should be in, in implemented in icus surgery transplants and infectious disease wards and also uh, monitoring the right concentration of the drug uh, by monitoring so all this uh, pharmacy uh, i mean a clinical pharmacist does all this stuff and it is uh, to be honest it is not just a piece of cake uh, it takes lot of effort lot of uh, uh, time and also lot of uh, uh, brainstorming before you go and at least suggest a uh, doctor uh, that you, doc you need to change this uh, medicine because it is interacting or something so before that you need to do a lot of uh, brainstorming so and this is not a very easy task to be very honest uh, wherever you work you work as a clinical pharmacist or a clinical pharmacist working in a pharmaceutical uh, company setup everywhere it is very tough job so uh, in pharmaceutical uh, uh, as a clinical pharmacist uh, in a uh, uh, hospital setting uh it is very much essential also to know how much you are paid in india i feel i believe that in india it, uh, the uh, situation is still uh, developing or it i can say that it is in baby steps right now uh, uh where whereas in us clinical pharmacists have so much of uh, uh, ability to uh, put in his or her expertise into or the scope uh, to put in his or her expertise and for which they are also paid uh, a good amount of salary so this also makes me uh, uh, wonder how much a normal clinical pharmacist would uh, be paid uh, as a fresher so uh, i did not have any data for this so i thought of going and checking into class door so next slide please yeah so i i saw that uh, clinical pharmacist in india salary is uh, something around 24961 rupees on an average without any compensation cash yes, compensation uh, for the role so uh, this is today's data from glassdoor uh, and next slide please there are uh, few uh, there are very few uh, hospitals which i see in uh, glassdoor giving this uh, or hiring the clinical pharmacist understanding their importance uh, so i have taken the top 3 hospitals and how much their salary is so apollo gives you something around 15967 rupees and dr reddy is 19000 to 22000 gives 18000 to 41000 but this should not be a uh, reason not to join as a clinical pharmacist so these i def- i mentioned that this would be your salary only if you are a fresher and i believe the lot of students are going into this uh, sites and checking and that uh, i'm paid only this you should not be demoralized with this uh, to be honest if you start your career uh, in in uh, in corporate setup also you will not get uh, less uh, too much of amount initially so you have to prove your skills 
and it is very much essential that we prove our skills dr prajpala is showing her skills uh, in uh, yashoda hospital and i am very proud of her and i am also very uh, proud of myself that we got a senior like her because i was in the third batch and she was in the second batch and they actually we had a very joint study sort of every time uh, we were in the hospitals so uh, we learned a lot from our seniors so this uh, coordination should be there and i believe that clinical pharmacy dr prajula said it will take 10 to 20 years i believe it will not take not take 10 years if uh, we are expediting the process so uh, thank you if any questions are there i would be happy to thank you dr paul that was a wonderful session especially with several corporate hospitals now looking into set a, setting up uh, amsp programs and uh, clinical pharmacy's role will be very crucial in that aspect it was really a wonderful session dr paul uh, we would like thank to hear you me. from some of your experiences of st peter so uh, <coughs> whatever i am right now i would give all the uh, credit uh, or all the uh, what do you call everything is just because of st peter's i believe and uh, the effort especially uh, uh, jepal sir and other faculty members are putting in into this college uh, is uh, tremendous tremendous and i am very sure if a student is having talent and he is having a hunger to learn he will never be uh, uh, unseen in st peter's at least so uh, i i know uh, jabal sir would be understanding what i am trying to say so uh, even sometimes i feel that uh, th those days were the best days of my life when i was in the college uh, even though i hail from uh, very far away from warangal i i hail from tripura agartala so i never felt that i am ever from home so yeah i would uh, thank uh, st peter's uh, jabal sir Rashika sir, Rajshri ma'am, and all other uh, staffs, uh, faculty members, uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to make this presentation in this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Paul. We wish you all the success for your future endeavors. Also, thank you. Thank you so much. So, as we have come to the end of the session, I would now uh, request Ms. Shivani Rawla, Assistant Professor, St. Peter's Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, to deliver the oath of thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have successfully come to the end of another wonderful session. At the outset, I would like to thank our respected chairman, Sri T. Jaipal Reddy, sir, for his co co constant motivation. I also thank our LOC chair, principal, Dr. P. Rashika, sir, for his support. Uh, the event would not have been successful without our speakers, our proud mm -hmm. al alumni, Dr. Sabina Hussain, assistant professor and HOD, pharmacology, Genba College of Pharmacy, Pune, uh, Dr. Prajwala, clinical pharmacist at Vijaya Diagnostic uh, Hyderabad, Dr. Mrigangapal, aggregate report analyst, Pfizer Private Limited, Chennai. I would like to thank uh, organizing team, Dr. Pravi, convener, HOD, pharmacy practice, Dr. Randi Chaudhary, uh, assistant professor, organizing secretary, uh, organizing committee members, uh, Mrs. Manushri, assistant professor, Dr. Darini, assistant professor, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Nandu sir and Sri Kansa for their technical support. I would like to thank all the teaching and non-teaching staff of uh, Saint Peter's Pharmacy College. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Shivani Rawda, for your vote uh, of thanks. As we have come to the end of the session, uh, we feel uh, elated to have conducted this webinar today, and we sure we would like to meet you on another session very soon. Thank you.